Today's Traverse Talks guest is retired U.S. Air Force Major General and now author Sarah Zobel. She was inspired, intrigued, and frustrated by an enduring friend's battle with depression. So Zobel set herself the task of first coming to understand and then to explain for lay people the science behind depression. Her book, Fighting Chance, how unexpected observations and unintended outcomes shape the science and treatment of depression. You wrote the book, Fighting Chance, How Unexpected Observations and Unintended Outcomes Shape the Science and Treatment of Depression. But you're not a medical professional, as you mentioned in your book. You're a retired major general, a former vice director of the U.S. Defense Information System Agency. So why write this book about depression? I wrote this book because people like me should be able to understand. You shouldn't have to be a medical professional in order to understand what's going on in in someone who's really suffering. So for me, it was prompted by my experience with a longtime friend. We've been friends for 30 or 35 years now. And a little more than 10 years before I I retired from the Air Force, uh, she developed depression. She became suicidal. She was in and out of hospitals with suicidal ideation and, and suicide attempts. And it was a complete departure from the person that I had known for, at that point, about 20 years. So I watched this going on for the last 10 years of my Air Force career and just wondering what was going on. But more than that, I was afraid to interact with her. I was afraid oh. I would say something or do something or fail to say or do something, and she would kill herself. Oh, my gosh. So I wanted to know what was going on. I wanted to know what depression was. So you could better talk about it. So I could talk about it. I could talk to her. I could hopefully help her. I mean, that was, of course, mm. what I'd love to do to help her. Um, so after I retired and I had, of course, you know, some time in my hands, that's when I started looking into it. I did have a long uh, journey of learning because, like you said, I'm not a medical professional. My my education was in computer science. So, But, you know, to me, while reading your book, I was like, but that's also about connections, point A, point B, what interferes with those messages being sent within the brain, within the computer. Yes. So I saw a connection there. Yes, yeah, so I do have a network perspective on what goes on, which is entirely appropriate. Uh, you can think of the, the brain as a connected network of computers, and uh, you can get pretty far understanding it that way. So ultimately, I almost wonder if it was out of love and care that you dove into this, I'm going to say, incredibly in-depth look at depression. I mean, I was like at Chapter 10 thinking, this woman has got to know so much about neurotransmitters and the fluids (laughs) in between our synapses. It was very fascinating. And you interlace each section with personal stories. Yes. How hard was it to find people to really tell you the truth about their mental state? It's challenging to get the first couple of interviews, but then when somebody talks to you and they realize, you know, you don't bite their head off, you don't embarrass them, they start spreading, you know, word of mouth about it's okay to talk to this lady. I made a commitment to them right in the beginning that I will change their identity as long as I can keep uh, some things, you know, so like age, gender, their symptoms, you know, and and their experience. That comes through, their voice comes through, but their identifying characteristics were changed. And I think that made them feel better that they could talk kind of anonymously to the world. And I thought that they were very open and forthcoming. And I really valued being able to put their stories in the book to help illustrate, but also help people understand, try to challenge the stigma of mental illness. Yeah, I appreciate that, too, because uh, there are even a few people you interviewed who admitted they didn't want to listen to themselves, that there was something wrong. Yes. And so they put on this, maybe it's society or just perceptions of you are not a good person if you admit that you have these struggles. And then reading about them and how they sought help. Or some of the stories were life itself forced them yes. to get help. Yes. Uh, so it was interesting to read about that. I'm really curious, though, why you decided, because it could have been incredibly technical all the way through, but why mm-hmm. lace in those personal stories? Because that's why it matters. Uh, I enjoy science. I love science. But the only reason that the science matters is because it's about people. It's because what happens to people. So that was a way to bring it back to what I see as reality. You know, instead of drawings, you probably saw some diagrams of, you know, here's a nerve cell. Like, yeah, like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. But 
you know, once you go off on a, how uh, circadian rhythms uh, affect somebody's life, it's better to actually put somebody in there whose life is affected by circadian rhythms, just to put a personality on it. Once research is made, then accepting that as fact and then implementing change for society takes so long. Yes. What are some things that you think need to change in the way society views, let's just say, depression? Right. I think that society needs to understand that mental illness is actually, it's a physical illness. There are physical things happening in the brain. The brain is an organ. And it's not a choice. It's not a personality quirk. And if people understand that, then they can be less judgmental about, let's say, depression. It's not just like, oh, that, you know, the person is down. She needs to cheer up, you know, just, hey, be happy, <laughs> you know, as if, as if you were, you know, doing it by choice. Um, so understand that mental illness is physical illness. Understand that there's a huge variety of treatment options. And um, since what you need to do is affect the physical fabric of the brain in order to get better, um, I think people ought to be more open to the variety of treatments that are out there. From what I read out of your book, it's seeing a psychotherapist or therapy or yeah. cognitive behavior, the medication, exercise, and diet. I mean, Sarah, she said I could call her Sarah instead of Major General. Sarah, it seemed to me that it's almost a miracle more of us don't have depression because of the myriad of factors that could lead somebody down that road. So one of the huge factors that will move a person towards um, having depression is chronic stress. And if you think about what's been going on uh, since in the last two years, you know, with COVID and um, our response to COVID. So people lost jobs. They had to worry about finances. And they had to deny themselves social contact. For a long time, people were not able to go outside, not able to exercise and eat like they wanted to. So we added on the bad, you know, chronic stress, not to mention worrying about your own health and the healthy loved ones. So you got chronic stress and adding to the bad side, and you're taking away the things that are we know to be good. Yes, because people were even afraid to exercise. I know, I know. And we learned so much. I mean, now, if we were doing it all again, we'd... We do it differently. We right. know more, but it is what it is now. <laughs> it is what it is. And now we have to uh, wait and help those recover. Well, first of all, understand. Understand they didn't they didn't choose it. They didn't just like cop a bad attitude when COVID, you know, shut down their lives. They underwent physical changes and they're gonna have to undergo physical changes to get back up to, to normal. I sometimes wonder if we have such a disconnect from recognizing that we're animals. Yeah, that we should be able to just, we should just be able to overcome this. Right. We should be able to outsmart it and just not be affected. I'm too strong for that. That's not going to happen to me. And that's a big issue. Um, Concepts of strength and weakness where, let's say, feeling down or even getting so far as to develop a mental illness is perceived as weakness. Even by, like you mentioned, some of the victims of a mental illness didn't want to see it, didn't want to admit it because they felt it was weakness, that they should just be able to power through and and get better and not take drugs, not talk to somebody. Was it your friend, the person who I think is the reason why you wrote the book on the journey? Didn't she lose a pet? Yes. And then spiraled. But there were other issues in the past that weren't addressed. So However, the loss of a pet yeah. almost was, oh, just buck up. It's just an animal. Right. And it, she felt like she couldn't talk to people because, oh, it, it's a dog. Go get another one. You know, just terrible things. And it was losing the pet didn't give her depression. Um, it was triggering event, not only losing the pet, but she died after old age um, you know, suffering. So it was this big, stressful buildup of my pet is going to die, my pet is going to die, and then the pet dies. So it was a big, stressful episode. And it was really the last straw. Mm -hmm. I could see it and understand it. In fact, I almost am perplexed by folks who go through so much. It's amazing what the human mind can keep going through or the body can keep adapting to. You lost a parent. You lost your second parent. Your child is having issues. Then your dog dies. And then you lose wage. And you're like, I'm okay. (laughs) And some people are, you know, there's a genetic component. People who suffered especially neglect or emotional abuse in early life, they're going to be more vulnerable to developing a depression as an adult. So these are things you, you can't do anything about, you know, your genetic inheritance, your what happened to you early in life, you, you can't do anything about that. But it does make you more vulnerable to actually develop depression and other mental illnesses in adulthood. 
Uh, Sarah, you say an important word there, vulnerable. Yeah. I don't think Americans do vulnerable. Oh, we think we shouldn't. You know, I grew up in the military. So uh, you can imagine that people in the military don't want to admit to a vulnerability, to a weakness. They are concerned about their careers. If they go talk to somebody or admit that, you know, something's wrong here, I think I need some help. It's a real challenge. Stay connected with NWPB by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Search NWP Broadcasting on any of these platforms and press the follow button. That's NWP Broadcasting on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and you will never miss a post from us. Let's reintroduce our guest, retired U.S. Air Force Major General and now author, Sarah Zobel. So segueing into your military career, did you grow up on base as a military brat? No, I feel like I grew up in the military because I went to, I entered the Air Force Academy as a cadet when I was 17. Okay, wait, how does one get into the Air Force Academy? <laughs> so uh, it is a long drawn out process. It involved, so having certain grades, um, certain community and sports activities, and then you had to get a nomination from a congressman or a senator. So well, yeah. Sarah. So it was long and drawn out. But once I'd gone through that whole process, of course, I was You're in. happy and enthusiastic. I was in, yes. <laughs> but I did enter at 17, which is still in my mind, and certainly for a me, young. I was a child. Yeah, yeah, I was a child when I went in. Um, and uh, four years as a cadet, and then a little more than 31 as an officer. So most of my life and my entire adult life was spent in the Air Force. In the Air Force. And you were drawn to the IT world and security, yes. correct? Yes. So those are two levels of careers that are pretty male-dominated. How does Sarah Isabel deal with that and become a major general? Well, sometimes it helps to be weird. <laughs> I mean, it, it breaks expectations when, okay, the general is coming, someone's going to, you know, or, or the colonel or somebody is important in the military is going to walk into the room, and it turns out to be a woman. Then all of a sudden, you know, whatever you were expecting, you suddenly realize, wait, something's different here. So that kind of gives you an entry into change, you know, mm. into doing something different or being something different. And, you know, you, you kind of smashed an expectation as you walked into the room. So now the door's wide open. You know, what's going to happen here? So good things can happen. Bad things can also happen, but good things can happen. Ah, I like that. Did any bad things happen to you? Oh, um, not terrible. Um, oh, good. Were you belittled? Um, condescended to sometimes, uh, but I think it kind of all washes out because I'm sure there's sometimes and I was uh, benefited by, oh, wait, we need a woman in this spot or, you know, I think it's... Uh, it balances. It balances. Diverse thinking, though, I appreciate what I heard. I have no idea who said this, <laughs> but they were talking about changes in the military, specifically Marines, that they realize having young, mostly males who are 18 years old may not be the future of what we need for war or protecting our country that we need older people who have their brains had developed past, yes. <laughs> right? And then they also said something like that about policing. Mm. Um, however, this is going to sound super, super stereotypical. I feel as if women may have a leg up on that mental maturity level. So I almost wonder if that's something we should do in the military more is get some ladies in there to help figure out things. I think it's moving that way. And I think if you look at what the military has done over time, so imagine World War I um, or even World War II in the trenches where you want someone to grab a rifle, run up a hill and start shooting people and half of them won't make it. Um, that's not... That's young men. That's young men. Frankly, that's young men and... You're not benefiting from a lot of emotional maturity on that one. In fact, it might be a negative. They say, oh, no. <laughs> Why am I doing this? <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. But war in the modern day is fought differently. There's a lot going on in cyber. There's a lot going on in, uh, in the intelligence that you get to see what's going on with the enemy. What are they doing? There's a lot that goes on in the public eye. I mean, if you look, look at what's going on in Ukraine, and we are watching what's going on in Ukraine, and, and our country's responding to it in ways that are not military because we have the constant journalism presence. We see what's going on and people see it and, and are reacting to it. Yeah. So it's different. War is different now. Well, two things I would love for you to describe. So war is different essentially because it's not this hand-to-hand -hand combat. We are in a realm where a lot of it is cyber. 
Right. It's I'm sure there there is a place where hand to hand combat and physical is happening. It's just not at the level of prevalence that it used to be. Uh, yeah, technology wise. And then the second thing is about what you were saying about cyber. Mm-hmm. Uh, in your view, with your career. What were some things, because I think you were looking into the vulnerabilities for both U.S. and allies and what they were. Did you get left with the sense of, okay, we got this covered, or did you learn things that made you fearful for the safety of Americans? I continue to be concerned for the safety of Americans. Um, Technology develops rapidly, and some of the same aspects of technology that let us do more also open more vulnerabilities. And certainly as we rely more and more on technology and we don't have non-technological workarounds, we're opening vulnerabilities as well. Um, I am at least comforted by knowing that there are really, really smart and dedicated people who are watching that and working on the vulnerabilities, but also um, working every day to make us safe. Oh, wow. So... Sarah, we have a question from one of our engineers, Jason Royals, who was also stationed in many of the places you were when he was in the military as a master sergeant. He wanted to know what were some issues when you started your career in 87 that were of great concern or challenge, and what are the great challenges today? Wow. Um, So I do think that the greatest challenge now has to do with the degree of interconnection and reliance that we have on everything technological. And when I say everything technological, we finally realized that things that are not formally known as computers are still vulnerable. Like light switches that are through your phone? Yes. So let's say smart houses or things that, you know, the um, let's say the electrical grid, um, yes. power generation, power distribution, um, say street lights, you know, traffic lights. These are things that we don't think of as being computers, but almost everything has a computer brain now. Wow. So they are in some way vulnerable. So that's really the greatest challenge now is the degree of interconnectedness, the uh, degree of computer smarts and things in everything, the Internet of everything now. Um, Back in the day, back when I started and... (laughs) Back in 1987. Back back in 1987 when I graduated, computer security or, uh, or... I don't think we were even using the word cyber yet. I think that term was came along sometime in the 90s. But computer security, it was considered a, I don't know, a, a very high-tech special field, um, very highly classified. What we were doing was very highly classified. So it made it difficult to communicate with the, to either learn or to, you know, share knowledge with, with the outside world, where the outside world definitely needs that knowledge. Think about the banking industry and, you know, the, everything that can be affected and is affected by cyber intrusions now. Um, so back then, yeah, the fact that it was so close held um, and very, it was just such a tight little community that was working on what we now call cyber. I think that was the biggest challenge back then. Listen to all the episodes of Traverse Talks with the PBS Passport. Members who give $60 a year are automatically subscribed. Not sure if you have access? Call 1-800-842-8991 to check if you have PBS Passport. Our guest right now on Traverse Talks is author of Fighting Chance, Sarah Zabel. So back to your book, you spoke to so many people about their personal experiences with different levels of different types of mental disorders or disease. I took away, too, that we need to really decide is diseases when we know what is causing it, but disorder. Right. Disorder, there is something that is messing with your life. And disease, I think it's, I don't know, kind of... (laughs) Yes, in order to call it a disease, we need to know what causes it. To me, like, okay, (laughs) I will accept that as the definition, and I'll put it in the book as that's the definition of disease. Um, Disorder means that it's not only that you, well, you know, you you read about the symptoms of depression, what depression involves. So, of course, you have the, the really sad mood. Or loss of pleasure in everything; those are key. You know, one of one of those has to be present. But then people also either often sleep too much, or they can't sleep. They eat too much, or they can't eat. 
They have trouble remembering things. Their minds, you know, just won't work. Um, it's, you know, a whole slew of symptoms. So you could have some of those symptoms and just be living your life and doing fine. It's a disorder when there's enough and it's bad enough that it's messing with your life. So you're not functioning the way yeah, you you're, used you're to. Yeah, you just not functioning, and it, and it matters. It's like your your family's falling apart, or you're you're you know doing really poorly at your job, and you're worried about your job, um, or that you know like you stop eating and stop sleeping enough that you're physically ill as well as you know mentally. So I hope someday they understand enough about it to make it a disease. <laughs> <laughs> um, but <laughs> what to me, it's, it's like a, yay, it's a disease now. <laughs> we know more. That's what yes. it means. Yay. I hope so, too. And you mentioned in the end of the book that you're, if this was written 10 years from now, yeah. you were confident that it would be a completely different book because more would be known. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it feels like we are just learning so much so fast. There's new technologies um, like the, the imaging Imaging technology, seeing what's going on in a person's brain as they're experiencing some of these uh, symptoms. Um, it's very enlightening. So, and that's something that's just really, really come to the fore recently, and they're doing more and more of it. They're also experimenting with more and more treatments and learning from that. So, yeah, I do think in about, I guess I published it a year ago, so let's say nine years <laughs> um, from now, it would be a very different story. Ah, oh, maybe there'll be a, an update to your an book. An update, yes. I would, <laughs> Throw that, that old book awesome. away. Here's a new one. <laughs> um, in your book, as you've talked to so many folks, I'm really curious what particular stories impacted you on a on a deeper level than maybe others? So always the stories about suicide, because oh. that's one thing I learned. So I got started in this journey because I was worried about my friend. She had uh, severe treatment resistant depression and she was also suicidal. I thought those were the same thing. When I got started, I thought that suicide and I put in the book like is like a stage four of depression. Like you, you know, go through these stages and then you you inevitably get suicidal. But suicide is different. It has a different biology. Um, there are a lot of people who are depressed, who are having to live with all these horrible symptoms and um, and their terrible mood and miserable every second of the day. They're not suicidal. It just it's just not there. Now, of course, everyone I'm talking to did not complete suicide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a lot of them came right up to the point, but something happened. They did not complete it. Um, but seeing what a different person they were, how their thoughts were so different, how suicide or suicidality was a really different experience for them. That's what spoke mostly to me, because mm -hmm. as I was writing the book, my friend was in depression and she uh, attempted suicide again. So when I wanted to start the book and, and complete it in part to help her and in part to help others, it was uh, very frustrating to encounter this experience of suicide. And I don't think I quite understand this aspect. And I don't, I don't know if, um, if I'm going to be able to do anything to help. Mm. I don't want to spoil it. She lives. She's happy. She, uh, I was going to ask. One of, yes. One of the treatments uh, is actually ketamine treatment. That's a new one. Yes. Uh, she went through the course of it, and it just, it worked. It lifted her up. She didn't immediately respond. About 60% of the people who take ketamine respond right away. She didn't. So she had to keep going through the course, but she did respond, and now she's she's back to normal. She's the friend from... 20 years ago rather than the one from 10 years ago. You mentioned ketamine. Can yeah. you describe what that procedure is like? Uh, so there's a couple of procedures. So ketamine has been known as a horse tranquilizer. Um, and when it's given to somebody in a very low dose, very, very low dose, um, like one hundredth of a normal anesthetic dose, uh, it affects the brain. It restores these connections. These little connections in your brain just start growing again. Oh. They, and they grow for hours. And it actually, like I said, depression and other mental illnesses, there is a physical basis. Uh, among the physical bases of uh, depression is you lose these little synaptic connections. So ketamine makes them grow. It makes them grow for a couple hours. So they give you ketamine like, you know, maybe three days a week for a couple of weeks and then two days a week and then once a week. And your brain is able to grow and recover. So it started out as a um, IV treatment, and there's a more recently there's a nasal spray now. You have to do it in a uh, a medical establishment because it can be a bit psychedelic, apparently. So um, you know they don't want to just have people take it at home. I understand that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can understand. That. Speaking of psychedelic, I do believe you mentioned psilocybin. Yes. What do you know about that? So they're experimenting with it. Uh, they're looking to see a similar effect as what you know what ketamine is doing um, with psilocybin. Uh, it's 
hard, I think, to get scientific evidence about how something like that works because... The classification of drug and... Um, it's more like if you really want to test something, then you need to do this, uh, like these um, double-blind tests where the patient doesn't know are they on the drug or the placebo, and the physician doesn't know. So the physician doesn't have this expectation that he's kind of, you know, giving to his patient. Really hard to do that when With you're taking like psilocybin. I mean, like, you're going to know. <laughs> you took psilocybin, and the physician's going to know. So it's really, really hard to, you know, are people responding because they think they should respond, or are people responding because it actually does something in the brain that helps? Oh, boy. I can't wait to read more about that. Um, so... What was your experience with mental health in the military? I know you mm -hmm. touched base on that earlier about being strong and not vulnerable. Yeah. But what does a soldier or an airman do if they need help? It's just very frustrating having retired from the military and then learning what I learned. Now I, I look back. I look back at people that I thought I was dealing with a disciplinary problem oh. and I was dealing with a medical problem. And I, I was not helpful. I was... Applying discipline when a person needed, really needed to see a doctor. And now I look at the symptoms, what they were doing, uh, you know, outbursts of anger and, you know, things like that. And I realized that, okay, this person had a, you know, was depressed, had a mental illness, maybe bipolar. They needed to see a doctor. Wow. They can be helped. They can be, um, you know, cured. But I was thinking, you know, you need to go to anger management or something like that. So... You oh. live and learn, and, and I, I do regret that I didn't know what I know now earlier. Yeah. So overall for us, can you describe why someone should read your book? They should read my book because they would greatly benefit from understanding better what happens to people with mental illness, but also what happens to themselves. Um, you know, someone like me, I think I do not have the genetic inheritance. I do not have the early life adversity that would make me more vulnerable to something like depression. But when I'm undergoing chronic stress, when I'm not exercising, not eating well, those same sorts of changes are happening in, in my brain as well. So I think that reading the book gives people a better understanding of people with depression but also of themselves and what can be happening inside the brain. Yeah, I think you can only benefit from understanding yourself more on that level. What are you doing now in retirement that you finished your book? I'm working on a second book. What is it about? So it's about the, how the natural world affects mental health or mental illness. It's just so fascinating to me, the fact that light, sleep, food, uh, you know, oxygen, all these things affect how our brain works. And sometimes they affect it to the point of either mental illness or, or challenging your mental health. So I'm digging into that, trying to understand that and put it in a form that other people can understand it as well. Oh, that's exciting. Sarah, thank you so much for being with us. That's retired Air Force Major General Sarah Zobel, author of Fighting Chance, How Unexpected Observations and Unintended Outcomes Shape the Science and Treatment of Depression. Thank you for listening to Traverse Talks, and I hope if you have any feedback or comments that you'll write to us, our email is info at nwpb.org. That's info at nwpb.org. I'm Sue Ann Ramella.